psalm that they, Jesus quoted in a couple weeks' time in the Garden of Gethsemane. Or sorry, on the cross, I should say. Which one is it? Boy, it's on the cross. He says, the psalmist begins by saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And while I don't feel like that so much in terms of what's going on in the world, I know there are a lot of people who would feel like that and who would echo that right now. Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? And it's interesting to note that the rest of us, the rest of the world seems focused, all the world seems focused on COVID. And yet the fact is life still goes on for a lot of people who are living in struggles and anguish and difficulties. Uh, in the midst of COVID. My God, my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, I, but I find no rest. Yet, yet, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. Or as other translations put it, you inhabit the praises of your people. You dwell in it. You live in it. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted you, and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. Lord God, as we come this morning to worship again, it comes down to, um, will we trust you? Whether it be with the uncertainties we're feeling around COVID or whether it be other things going on in our life. Maybe we feel like you have forsaken us and you don't seem present nearby. I pray that as we come together in your name, as your people come, that you would, uh, strengthen and encourage us, that we could encourage each other in your name. Spirit of God, uh, as we pray, thank you that you are praying and interceding for us. Take us to the Father, I pray, from whom all blessings flow, with whom we can trust fully and completely. Open our eyes and our ears to hear what you are saying to us today that we might receive. Thank you in Jesus name. Amen. So today um, we are jumping in to Romans 12, 1 and 2. And as I've said, we are going to look at the mind and what it means to renew the mind. Um, but first I thought, well, hold it here. What is the mind? And, and let's see if we can be on, at least you can know where I'm at when I come to and think about the mind. Because potentially you have a different understanding of what that means. Um, so I'm going to switch over to a, a simple screen here. Um, just a second here. Just for this one slide. There, and I'm going to start from there. Uh, some of the, some of you who were at BCC will recognize this. I think I may have used this before, but I, I like what Dallas Willard has um, as the parts that make up who we are. And I understand that there are different understandings of, of what this is. So this, I'm just using Dallas Willard's because I think it, it's, uh, it's helped me. So of course, at the very core of who we are is our heart. Um, and it's the boss of our lives. That's why Jesus says, and God focuses so much on the heart. Where is our heart at? But, and I'm going to be just skipping through this, by the way. I'm not going, this is not my sermon, so I want to go fast. Uh, but the heart is where decisions are made. And, um, but after the heart comes the mind. And the mind is always trying to tell the heart what to do. It's making suggestions. Um, and the mind has two parts to it, okay? The mind has our thoughts and our feelings. And 
what happens is our mind feeds our heart thoughts, feeds our mind, or sorry, our heart feelings. And depending on which is stronger, we then make decisions and actions. Um, from there, then what the mind, what the heart decides based on what the mind influences, then our body uh, acts upon it. Um, which then affects the people around us, right? If, if I am, let's take a very simple thing. If my heart decides that, if my mind convinces my heart that I don't like you, or if you say something mean to me and my feelings are hurt, and my mind convinces my heart that I hate you, and my body then says, oh, well, then I can do something about that. I can hit you. And so the body responds to the heart and mind by punching you, which then affects, of course, my social life because suddenly we don't want to hang out together anymore and there's hatred and there's all kinds of things. And, and Dallas Willard then says that all of that makes up who we are, the soul, which Paul talks about in Romans 12, 1, listen, give up all that you are, your bodies, all that you are, give it over. Now, the body that Paul talks about in 12, 1 is not the body that's listed here. He's talking more about the soul, that, that give all you are as a, as a sacrifice to God, okay? So when I talk about mind, it's our thoughts and our feelings. Any questions about that? Good. Um, I'll go back to here. I'll es oh, escape, escape, stop sharing. There we go. Now, um, oh, I had wanted to have this up on the screen, but I couldn't, strangely, I couldn't do that one in what I needed it. So I, I'm not going to. Um, Rhonda. Could you please read Romans 12, 1 and 2, please? Do you have a Bible? Or Ed, Ed's fine, too. Ed, you're good. I'm getting there. Yeah. Okay. I, my phone is <laughs> being used, and I don't want to go running for a yeah, Bible. that's before. fine. What did you say? Romans 12. 1 and 2. Hi, Karen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Thank you, Ed. Um... So welcome to week two of COVID-induced worship, I call it, <laughs> but not influenced, hopefully. Um, so because of God's mercy, we've just heard, we are called to offer our whole selves to God and to be transformed by renewing our minds so that all that we think, all that we say, and all that we do reflects the very heart of who God is. Now, Paul is going to give uh, some concrete teaching on what that means, the rest of Romans. But before we journey through the rest of Romans, I want us to step back and take a look at the big picture of who God has called us to be. Because if, if we are just given a bunch of things to do and don't, without understanding why that is, without understanding what it's about, then suddenly it becomes a very, easily becomes a very onerous and a legalistic thing but if we understand what god is up to in the big picture then suddenly his commands can make sense as to why we want to do these things and thus renew our mind um because it's only as we increasingly understand who god has created us and called us to be that we will understand why we are commanded to renew our minds and thus be increasingly transformed in our day-to-day -day lives 
and we will not be so easily distracted by the many faulty and false ways of living in this world, including the ways that the church can often offer. Um, and I have, want you to have a picture in your mind here because I look at the life of Christ and I've been thinking a lot about him because I'm not doing a very good job at times of these days of renewing my mind. It's going to crazy places. And, and I often go back to Jesus who said, um, who is so focused on, on his mind as to who, who, he res who was calling the shots, who he was responding to, who was it? Who was God reminding, or Jesus responding to his father and his father alone? And who did he go to for direction, for, for instruction, to his father? So he says, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only see what his father is doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. That is a fully renewed mind. He goes on to say that for the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works I am doing testify that the Father has sent me. He knew specifically that he had some tasks to do. He had a calling by God. And Jesus encountered a lot of naysayers. He encountered a lot of name callers. He was called Satan. He was called a Samaritan. He was called all kinds of awful things. He, he encountered uh, misguided people. He encountered pressures to perform. His very closest people wanted him to do things that he knew that he was not called to do, and they thought they were good things. He encountered people who wanted him to conform, to reform, to perform. Yet because he stayed close to his father, because he clearly understood what his calling was, he was able to navigate in and through all of it. So I want us to step back and, and ask the question, what is our calling? And the person who has helped me significantly in this thinking, among many others, but is uh, John Stackhouse um, uh, from my school I went to. He's, I'm greatly indebted for what follows. And he writes that we have two callings, okay? There is the human calling. You're a human being. God has called you to be a human being. And this is a calling that is for everyone. And it's a calling that's going to continue into eternity. And it's a calling that we shall explore today. And I think we should be able to finish it next week. The second calling is specific to us as followers of Jesus. Okay, so there's a difference here. Do you make sure you understand that? There's the human calling, but then there's a calling for those of us who follow, who claim, and Jesus as Lord and Savior. And this calling is a calling that is only for this side of eternity only. And that's what we're going to cover after Easter. So first, the human calling. Now, when you open your Bible, the very first thing one learns is what? About God. Anyone? I'm, I'm going to try this and see if we can, if you can quickly unmute and answer, that'd be great. If not, I'm just going to keep talking. But hearing another voice might be nice. What's the first thing we learn about God? He's yes. a creator. <laughs> He's a creator. Thank you. God is a creative God. In the beginning, God created. And the second thing we learned about him is that he makes very good things. Behold. Initially, it's behold, it was good. And then it's at the very end, it's it was very good. Okay. Creator God, he makes very good things. Now, because we live in a culture that is uh, multicultural, that has all kinds of views of what life is about and why we are here and et cetera. Um, I want to point out one thing. Most cultures throughout time have viewed world and the world in terms of a circle, okay? The circle of life, you may have heard of it. There's birth, then there's growth, and then there's decline, and then there's death, and then there's birth, and then there's growth, and then there's decline, and then there's death. This is what is called the circle of nature. 
but that is all it is. But some cultures and spiritualities, if you want to call it that, make it as not just the cycle of nature, but actually the cycle of our purpose in life. And the Lion King, ultimately, the movie, um, popularized this uh, as it talked about the circle of life. But here's the thing. Christians, we believe that the Bible tells us who we are and what our purpose is. And, and the Bible does not say that life or history is a circle like this. In fact, the Bible at its very core is a story. A story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and everything in between. In other words, according to the Bible, history is not cyclical, it is linear. It has a purpose, it is going somewhere. So if we're going to make sure that our thinking is renewed, we should start at the beginning. Before the awful picture of humanity's rebellion against God that Paul paints in Romans 1, before sin corrupted our world and our minds, we need to turn to Genesis 1. So the question that presents itself first is, what is the first commandment in Scripture? You may be interested to know that it's not worship God. It's not a golden rule. It is a series of creative commands. God spoke. In other words, he commanded the heavens and the earth into existence. And then he proceeded to command the rest of creation into being. And as we already heard at the end of Genesis 131, he says he saw all that he had made and it was very good. Stackhouse writes, Christianity revels in the goodness of the world. Animals matter, plants matter, oceans, rivers, lakes matter, hills and valleys, mountains, and the pebbles matter. The air matters. Chris, you see that pebbles matter, Chris, and you are a pebble cake, cake taker, picker upper. Chris loves picking up pedal, pebbles, by the way, on anywhere she can find them. Hawks, and so are Neva and Dara. Oh, really? Wow. So there you go. God intended all these things to exist, and God made them very good. Let's say that together. Don't unmute. Just say very good out loud to your voice. Very voice. good. There we go. Thank you. Very good. And, and this is important because some people, and yes, some Christians, believe that the world is a bad place, or believe that the world is a place to be endured, or that the physical world prevents one from being spiritual. And nothing could be further from the truth. God called the physical world very good and determined that it would play an important part in his plan for his creation. And this, again, is something that um, is, some, is often not believed in, both in, in the outside Christianity, but sometimes also in Christianity. We tend to we can say, I'm going to be super spiritual. We're just waiting for the new world or the, the heaven, and, and we're just enduring what we have to go through here. Now, circumstances can make that, but not creation. And so, by the way, just to let you know, we've made some mind decisions here so far already, okay? I have told you that our history, our meaning, is not circular, but linear. Now, someone else will say, no, Mark, you're wrong. I, my mind tells me that it is. I look at life and I say, well, there's, there's birth, there's growth, there's decay, there's death, there's birth. And so it's circular. So I'm making a decision based on the word of God to understand that history is linear. And that is a renewed mind aspect of my faith. But there's another one that's, is that God is a creative God. Now, if you ask people who God is, most of them won't come up with the creative part, initially at least, maybe later on. But it's interesting to note that we so often neglect this part of who God is, that fundamentally he is a creative God as he presents himself in scripture 
at the beginning. Second, thirdly, I should say the other mind decision that we've encountered so far is that matter is not bad, it is good. And again, the church hasn't always been very strong on this, especially say it when it comes to uh, sexuality, which has said, uh, you know, sex is a bad thing, or um, uh, that idea that, you know, we need to put off our de food or des other desires that we have because they're bad. Now, please understand me, there are times where we do that as an, for an express purpose, and we, we lay it all at the foot of cro the cross. But God has told us that the earth and all that he created and all that's in it is for our enjoyment. It is good. So again, ask yourself the question. And as I, as I speak here today, I want to invite you to do something. Whenever you hear your mind saying, hey, I don't agree with that, just write it down or jot it somewhere. Or I do agree with it. Or... If you have a question about it, jot it down and we can ask that later on, okay? So what next? Um, Stacko points another challenge and this has to do with ethics. And this is, this is a bit of a side note, but I feel like it's a pretty important one. People speak as if we are still in the Garden of Eden, as if all creation is still all good. That if we would just leave the world alone, and the extreme form of this I've mentioned before is that if we would just eliminate human beings from the earth because they're the cause of all the problems in the world, then the world would flourish. That the world in its natural state, untouched by humans, is simply an unqualifiedly good. And here's the important part. This is what I want you to hear. Anything natural, that is anything unaffected by and not a product of human action, is pronounced good. This is what these people will tend to say. Now that is often referred to in terms of creation itself, but it also plays out in, in, in how we live and this understanding. So for instance, it shows up in the phrasing, God made me this way, or God made it this way, as if that settles the issue. It comes out like God doesn't make junk or God doesn't make mistakes. The most common use of this argument in current ethical discussion is in the realm of gender and sexuality. If some form of sexual or gender, gender difference can be shown to be the direct result, say, of a, of, of, of a brain development, and thus is perfectly natural, then such different ought to be validated as being just as good as the heterosexual norm. In other words, they say what is, is good. But here's the problem. Stackhouse says we haven't lived in Eden for a long time. And a lot has happened since the Garden of Eden. A lot of it pretty bad. Time and evil have literally changed who people are. So just because this is who I am does not automatically equate to this is what I ought to be. For me specifically, in my family, it's the tendency to addiction. I have generations in my family who have expressed and who have express addiction in various forms from generation to generation. So do I get to go around and say, hey, I'm gonna do whatever addiction feels good at the moment because that's just who I am? No, why? Because I know that addiction is something that destroys. And so I have to be aware that though this is part of who I am, it is not who I ought to be. So when people say, well, the world is all good and that just is, and including who I am is all good and therefore I can, it's, it's okay to be who I am. A way to think of it is, well, sin has messed up a lot of who we are. And so it's not as simple as that. A 
It's not as simple as it's all good. Which takes us then to Genesis 1.26. God then said, let us make, and I'm reading the a long text here. So if you want to follow along in Genesis 1.26, you could, following. Then God said, let us make human, humankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he made, and it was very good. And on, there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. We humans are made in the image of God. That is, we are to resemble and act like God, such that when we interact with our world and with each other, those watching should say, wow, watching her, wow, watching him is like watching God. It's uncanny how much she is like him, or he is like him. Now, here's the interesting thing. God never tells us what parts of him are imaged in us or on us. There have been lots of suggestions, many of which are true and good. But perhaps trying to figure this out is not what we should be doing. Perhaps we should do what we should do is listen to what God wants us to do with our imaging. If we are called to reflect and the very heart of who God is in, in, in our lives, then we should see what he's asking us to do with it. And what happens next is that God, having created humanity in his image, rather than telling exactly what aspects of us are like him, he gives us a task. He gives us a role, something to do. And what is that task? It is to be creative. Here's what God says. He says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Stackhouse makes the comment that God seems to command. In fact, he actually even seems to over command in fact he actually does over command for us to have sex he says be fruitful have a kid multiply have lots of kids fill the earth that's a lot of kids to have so why is god commanding us to have lots of kids the next two commands explain the triple overemphasis of the first one our task as human beings is to subdue and have dominion over all creation. Now, there was no way that Adam and Eve could subdue and have dominion over all creation without lots and lots of other humans to help them. The words subdue and dominion are strong words. They are words that require hard work and energy. They are words that often are misunderstood. So why, why did God give us this command? He's just made the world, and he's declared that it was very good. Stackhouse continues. He says, very good it was, but it's not perfect. The world is created with massive potential to be turned by us creative creatures into reality. In other words, it was very good, but it wasn't finished yet. It wasn't perfect in the sense that there was things to do, to discover, to grow. We 
are called by God not to simply observe the world, to live in the world, or just enjoy it. We are called by God to make something of it. The world is a giant art studio filled with paints and canvases and brushes and easels into which God invites the human beings as artists. And by artists, I mean mothers and fathers. I mean mechanics and scientists. I mean inventors and musicians. I mean politicians. I mean everyone. The world is very good, yes, but it is wild, and therefore it needs to be subdued. It needs to be ruled. It needs to be cultivated so that it can become everything it can be. Now, the words, as I said earlier, subdue and dominion have been used, especially in modern times, to give us permission to do whatever we want with the world, to use it up, as some people say. It's as if God has given us free reign to dominate his creation in any way we see fit. But it doesn't take much reflection to realize, hold it here. <laughs> is that who God is? Does God just use us up? in any way he sees fit? No, that's not who he is. God is not some two-year-old who builds a brick tower only to gleefully, promptly knock it down as if the sole purpose of the tower, building the tower, was to destroy it in the first place. God is not a two-year-old kid. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, the mandate that humans have been given is captured in the Hebrew word shalom, commonly translated peace. But it also has the meaning, and there's a lot of it's interesting, peace is the predominant understanding, but if you look it up in the concordance, there's all kinds of other meanings for this word, and it, one of the main other meanings is, is this, the flourishing of things, of all things. This flourishing is not only of individual things, of each human being, but also each animal, each tree, each landscape, each waterway, each relationship among individuals, each group that individuals form, each relationship among groups or between groups and individuals, the whole of creation in loving harmony with God. Shalom is literally global flourishing, and it is the intended outcome of God working with God's humanity to cultivate the world. I hope at this time, for those of you here last week, that you immediately think of the Lord's Prayer. What's the Lord's Prayer? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, God wants us to create shalom, to bring everything that we come in contact with in a, in a way that is flourishing and growing, which is interesting because, and we're going to be covering on this, but the word gospel, what is the word gospel? It's good news. And, and this is good news. This is part of the good news that we have to share. I think of Jesus when he said, I have come that they have my, may have life and have it abundantly. Part of that is the life of enjoying his creation, of bringing goodness to all that we meet. So the picture is that God gives this command to Adam and Eve and to humanity, and they go out and they are to move from the initial garden that's planted by God and to make a garden of the whole planet. We are to be little lords, to be deputies of God, to be people who are commissioned by God to do God's work in obedience. Stackhouse says, God calls us to be creative to procreate in order to co-create. This, by the way, does not, is why one does not have to be a believer in God to be part of fulfilling this command. Remember at the beginning I said, there's a command that is for all humanity. 
there are many non-believers who are doing a much better job at fulfilling this command than a lot of believers. They are bringing shalom. And we ought not to be skeptical of this, but rather grateful. And instead, to see this as an opportunity to affirm the heart of God that is at work through them as an entry point of being able to share the gospel. And this is something that has really helped me a lot in the last several years. Um, to understand that as I see people doing things that are close to the heart of God. Um, this past week, we met someone who, who's uh, been caring for her mother, for um, their mother, for quite a while, for years. And, and she just passed away this week. And they are not, they don't believe in God. They don't even know, they have no concept of it, of God. And yet they spoke very, um, they spoke at the very heart of God in terms of how they cared for her mother through these years and until her, until her passing. And, and we didn't get a chance to, at that time, but had I had, I would have said that is the heart of God right there because God cares about our relationships. And we stand, I honor you for caring for your mother in very difficult times, for giving up your life and showing what God cares about. So think of the scientists who create good things, the, the inventors, the, uh, the people who do good work in all over the place. This is part of the flourishing that God has commanded us to do. And so, again, to affirm you, I want to encourage you to think about how you can affirm people and use it as a chance to share about this is who God is. This is the God, heart of God. You're practicing the very heart of God in doing this. This doesn't mean that their lives are not messed up in other ways. But we take what God is doing because we believe that God has been working in people's lives. And we build on that. And we give an opportunity for God to work there. So, God calls us to be creative. And here's the thing. God has never said, okay, we're, we are going to toss that command aside because now there's more important things to do. There are more important commands to obey. He never says that. In fact, this command to be creative in the way I've described, that to bring peace, shalom, to, to make the world a better place, if you want to put it in a simpler way, is a command that is going to carry on into eternity. In fact, alongside us yearning for God's full, full redemption, as we studied in Romans 8, we find out that all creation is eagerly awaiting the day when it is released from its bondage to decay and restored to its original intention. What God initially created us to do is what we are going to be doing forever. I want to say that again. What God initially created us to do is what we are going to be doing forever. Except we will be reigning, that is, subduing and having dominion, with Christ on the new earth. As the elders and the angels continue to gather around the throne and worship God, we will be worshiping God in the best way possible by being his people, the people we were created to be from the very start, made in the image of God to carry on his creative spirit in making the new earth even better than very good. So when you think of renewing your mind, please start here. Start at the beginning. In the beginning, God created, and start at the end, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and they will be my people, and I will be their God, and they will reign with me. And know that right here, right now, while we are on this earth, we are called to be God's farmers, wherever God has planted us, making shalom making peace, working towards the flourishing of all things in our little world, in my life, 
first and foremost, in my family, in my neighbors, in my community, to the stranger, to the widow, to the enemy, to the person I meet on the street, to all who I meet. Which brings me to the teaser for next week. When Jesus was asked this question, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? Let's pray. Lord God, um, it is easy to get tunnel vision, to get so focused on this command or that command, to uh, think of all the things that aren't happening. That is, I think of what Paul said when he said, keep watch, be alert, and pray. Lord, we are called to be people who are actively engaged in, in watching what's going on in this world, in looking for ways to, to bring your creative spirit to situations. And the cool thing is, because we have your spirit within us, as we stay close to you, as we yield ourselves to you, your spirit can lead us to, to do things, to say things, to thank things that we would never have thought before and to bring your shalom, your peace, your creative spirit to this hurting world. Thank you for the many ways that is being done in our community right now. And I pray for each of us that we might fully understand more and more your heart for us, that we might be your people who have your name and reflect who you are. Thank you also for your mercy for the many places in which we don't do that. Thank you that in Christ. We are forgiven. That if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we might again pick up who we are called to be. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, before we... Um, Invite Rick and Dara to lead us in worship. Any questions, comments, thoughts? And by the way, if you don't want to do it here, you can also email me, of course, or call me or...